Saxon Advanced Mathematics. This is a follow-up for Laura and Vivian on the questions that you asked me during our video chat today. I'm going to take them in the order, um, I'm gonna take them in a different order than you gave them to me uh, because I think it will flow a little bit better. So the first one that I'm gonna do is 1621. This is the one that has fractions that are in an equation and we are going to have some trinomials in our denominator. So let me copy first. Now as I'm copying this and I see this minus sign and then another binomial after it, I wanna put that parentheses around that right away because I know that sooner or later, I'm gonna to need to distribute that and I don't want to mess up that distribution. Okay. So I look at this and I think you said, Laura, that you your instinct was to do this as well. Uh, these trinomials can be factored. So let's start by factoring them and see what we come up with, okay? So remember that our rule here is that we want two numbers that will multiply to the final number, the C value, if you will, if you think of this the standard form, and then they add to that. So this one will be X minus two, X minus one, minus, and again, I'm gonna keep this in parentheses, this one would be x minus two, x minus three equals, and this one just stays the same. I'm gonna put it in parentheses for the same reason though, I wanna keep that really clean. Now, before I go any further, I see, okay, I've got a potential situation here where I could end up, depending on what values I get for x, I could get x in the denominator. I can't let that happen. So right away, I'm gonna say x minus two cannot be equal to zero. X, I'll put them in order. X minus one cannot be equal to zero, and X minus three cannot be equal to zero. Um, remember, if we have zero as a factor in a denominator, our world implodes. Um, we can't let it happen. It's impossible, and we can never set up a problem that will suggest, that, that will create that solution, okay? If you have ever seen videos of the kingdom, the old um, stadium in Seattle before CenturyLink and T-Mobile Park were built, uh, there is some great footage on YouTube that shows the implosion of the old kingdom. They blew it up with dynamite. They blew it in, actually, not out. And that's the visual I get in my head when I think about dividing by zero. You just can't let it happen because it's a big catastrophe. If you have not seen this video, or heck, even if you have, go watch it right now on YouTube. Just search Kingdom Implosion or something like that. Or, yes, Kingdom Implosion. Um, and you will see it. It is fabulous. There are some videos that are like six or eight minutes long that show them setting the charges and all of that. But then there's some other really glorious ones that are less than a minute, I think, that just show... <sighs> It's really cool, watch it. So this tells us that x cannot be equal to one, x cannot be equal to two, x cannot be equal to three. And I did that just by simple algebra here. So this we're going to keep in mind when we get to our solutions. But I noticed it here because I saw we have binomials in the bottom. Okay, now how are we going to either make these fractions all match so that we can combine them, or better yet, can we get rid of them all together? The answer to that question is right there in that equal sign. When we have an equation with fractions in the denominator, we can eliminate the fractions all together, or we can eliminate the denominators. We can do it. If we have an expression we can only match the denominators. Notice that den denominators abbreviated looks almost like demons. I find that quite apropos. 
Um, but because we have an equation, then there's hope in our lives and we know that we can eliminate them altogether. In both of these strategies though, we have to find the least common multiple. And that will be in this case, x minus one times quantity x minus two times quantity x minus three. It's all three of these things being multiplied together. So our next step, and I'm gonna switch colors to do this, is we are going to multiply each fraction, each, I'm sorry, each side of the equation and each term, because if we just multiplied it here, we'd have to distribute it. Um, so we can multiply each term by the LCM and then we'll see what happens. So this is the way I like to do that. I like to write it on a diagonal. That's too light. Um, let's go with orange. X minus one, X minus two. I would write these all in one line if I had the space, but I don't. So this one goes X minus one, X minus two. Okay, so notice I'm multiplying each term by the same expression, which is equal to our least common multiple. Okay, all three, kaboom. Now we can eliminate, cancel, top to bottom, and we should be able to knock out all of our denominators. Okay, so in this case, this one cancels here, this one cancels here, and I'm left with just that piece, and I'm gonna come back later and multiply those together, but I'll go through and do all my canceling first. This one, we can cancel the minus two and the minus three, leaves us with just the minus one. And this one, only the minus one will cancel, and we have the other two that are left. Okay, beautiful. Our denominators are all canceled now. We, could, we eliminated them completely. And this, especially this, is super important. Um, this particular least common multiple isn't important, but for either of these strategies, we have to find the LCM. So that's why I put that in the bubble. Um, all right, so now we have eliminated them against the LCM. And what we have to do is multiply the numerator by whatever was left behind of the LCM. So for the first one, it's going to be x plus two quantity, x minus three quantity. Okay, this minus sign is still here. X minus six quantity, X minus one. When we're talking math ease, we don't say parentheses. We refer to this X minus six as a quantity. So this is X minus six quantity times X minus one quantity. All right, equals, oh, I'm sorry. I copied this problem wrong right here. This should be a one, not an X. Hasn't mattered up till now, but now it does matter. Okay, so then this, the one just goes away when we have these two guys. So it's X minus two quantity times X minus three quantity. Okay, that looks a lot cleaner. And I think Laura, at one point you mentioned you don't know how John got everything in the numerator. Well, that's how. He blew up the denominators with the LCM, multiplying each term. Okay, now what we wanna do is take these back into their trinomial form again. So I'm gonna rewrite them. This one, again, we multiply the last two and then we add them for the middle. So that'll be x squared minus x minus six Minus, I'm gonna keep this in parentheses because that minus sign is still lurking. X squared minus seven X plus six equals X squared minus five X plus six. I don't need the parentheses there. All right, it's getting better. Now I'm gonna do two things in one step. I'm gonna change the signs here and I'm gonna bring these three terms over to this side so everything is on the left. This part I'll just copy. Okay, then these three, the signs change. So it's minus x squared 
plus 7x minus 6, and then these will come over so their signs will all change too. It'll be minus x squared plus 5x minus 6 equals 0. Okay, two things at once. That was tricky. Now I'm ready to combine like terms, and there's a lot. Let's do the x squared terms first. Remember, we need to consider the signs. I see plus, minus, minus, so that's gonna be minus x squared. Now, how about the plain x terms? I have seven plus five, that's 12, minus one, that's 11 x. And then plain numbers. I have three minus sixes, so that is minus 18 equals zero. Well, that. That calmed things down nicely, didn't it? All right, I don't like the minus sign in front of the x squared, so I'm gonna multiply this times minus one and this times minus one. That is perfectly legitimate. Even though this is zero and zero times minus one is zero, that used to bother me, you guys. I didn't think that was right, but it is, it's fine. But all these signs will change. x squared minus 11x plus 18 equals zero. Now, I'm gonna pray that John has been kind and we can factor this by inspection, just like we factored these by inspection way at the beginning. And he is kind. X minus nine quantity, X minus two quantity equals zero. Oh, okay. That was nice, wasn't it? We're just about there. Now we use, you can call it the zero factor theorem or the zero product theorem. It's the same idea that if we're multiplying two things together and they equal zero, then either that one's zero or that one's zero. So we can say either x equals positive nine or x equals positive two, right? We would swim that. We would say x minus nine equals zero, and then we would swim it to solve. And this one we would say x minus two equals zero, and then swim it to solve. So here it looks like is our answer, but we remember, oh, way back at the beginning, or close to the beginning, we said x cannot be equal to one, two, or three. So this answer, that's how I like to see this presented. Show that you calculated it as a value, then show that you ruled that out and leave just the other man standing. And that is the final answer, yay. Okay, that is 1621. Laura, if you still have questions on that, let me know. Next in complexity, I would like to handle 15.9. Okay, 15.9 is double checking the problem. I believe it's a polar coordinate that we're supposed to restate as rectangular. Yes, 15, nine, convert to rectangular, it's minus 15 at minus 335 degrees. Okay, let's review what exactly those numbers even mean. We always start with the one in the box. This is what we call the direction. And it is the angle measurement. We see the degree sign up there. there. So that's a, a big fat hint. And we remember that this system is often used by navigators on ships or in planes. And so the y-axis or the right axis, um, the i caret axis sometimes, we can liken that to the horizon, okay? So our eyes scan the horizon, and we start by measuring up and away in a counterclockwise decision. That is what we call the positive angle measurement, all right? This one is negative, but I'm telling you the normal. And then this number over here is what I call the distance. And it is, in the triangle that we're going to draw, it is the hypotenuse. And I should say it's the distance from the origin, all right? Now we can have positives or negatives here. And I'll, when we draw the picture, I will review for you what exactly that negative sign means there. 
Um, I was going to say something, but I forgot. I'll think of it later. All right, so let's start drawing the picture. Here are our four quadrants, 90 degrees in each one. And we see, we always start with the angle, and we see that there's a negative sign. That means instead of going in the normal way, we're going to go down and around this way instead. So we're going to measure this. We have to go 335 degrees. Remember that each quadrant is worth 90. So when I go this far, I've gone 90. That's 180. This is 270. So mentally my brain goes, okay, let's take the full 360. No, let's not do that. Let's take the 335 that we're trying to measure and subtract out the 270 that we've gone in the first three quadrants. That means we have to go 65 more degrees. That means we have to go most of the way, all the way to there. Okay, sometimes it's helpful to draw this like this. Right, and even write the pieces, 90, 90, 90, that's 270, we need another 65. Right, so there are the degrees as I map them out against the four quadrants, all right? This doesn't have to be a perfect representation. Um, that means that this angle, if this whole thing is 90 and 65 of it are up here, that means this is only 25 degrees, right? That is not very big, but I don't wanna draw it too small because then my numbers all get squishy. So it's okay if this is a little bit distorted. Um, just do what works for you. Now, the distance that we said here is not positive 15, which I could just mark anywhere out here. It's negative 15. So that means that my angle actually goes, or my distance actually goes in this direction. So I'm gonna make this darker to show this is the actual triangle and I'm interested down here. It was a trick. I extend that line. And then remember that when we take our direction and our distance and use them to form a triangle, we always go back toward the horizon or the X axis. So I always connect it back this way. That's how you draw the triangle. Some people think, well, couldn't I draw the triangle this way? That's not the right way to do it. Don't draw your triangle to the x-axis, draw it to the y-axis, or again, if you think of it as the horizon, it helps me always wanna go back to the horizon. All right, so now we have a triangle that is negative 335 degrees, because we found positive three, we, we did the negative 335 degrees, we found this 25, but then our distance was negative, so we went the opposite way. Right? We didn't go the way that the triangle told us to. We went the opposite way. This, we know, this heat, I'll use this same marker. This is a 25 degree angle. I'm gonna squiggle out this 90. That was how we counted the degrees. I don't want that to confuse us anymore. And this distance is 15 units from the origin. Notice that I'm not using any kind of grid or scale. Remember how we used to mark these things out? We don't have to do that anymore. We can just say whatever we want it to say, right? Okay, so we've got this and this figured out, but what we need to find are rectangular coordinates, which mean we want to know, second I'm looking for, there it is, different color marker. We need to know this value, because that will be our right value. And then we'll also need to know this value, because that will be our quote unquote up value, right? So now I'm gonna take a minute and draw the way I want my answer to look. It's going to have a sign and a number for the right value, and it's gonna have a sign and a number for the up value. Now looking at this, I can see my points down here in the third quadrant, it's gonna be negative right, and it's gonna be negative up. Remember right and up are just different names for the X and the Y axis, right? This is the right, and this is the up. They're better than X and Y because they describe what they actually are, right? So if we have positive right, that means from the origin, 
We're going this way. These are the positive numbers on the x-axis. It matches. The negative numbers on the x-axis go this way, and so we call this a negative right, and that's what ours will be. Same thing with the uh, y-axis. The positive numbers on this side, so we call that a positive up. The negative numbers on the y-axis are down here, and so we call that a negative up. And again, our point is down there, so it's gonna be a negative right and a negative up. Okay, but how far do we go? Well, that's where we use sine and cosine to help us out. Because if we use this angle to guide us, then this is the adjacent side, and this is the opposite side, right? So right, is associated with adjacent and the up is associated with the opposite. I'm using our abbreviations. That helps us remember which trig signs to use because the one that will relate the adjacent to the hypotenuse is cosine, right? Oscar had a hold and the opposite that will relate the opposite side to the hypotenuse, that's sine, because Oscar had, right? So whenever we're trying to find the right and the up values, we can use cosine and sine in that order to set up the little expressions that we wanna to solve to get those values. So we know that the format we use is we say that the cosine of 25 degrees equals We'll call this the R value, or the, well, let's just say A, A or R, because A equals R, over the hypotenuse, which is 15. And this one, we can say that the sine of 25 degrees will equal the opposite side over 15. So we can say this is adjacent and this is opposite. If that helps you, you can use that notation. We could also say that this is the right side and this is the upside, whichever or both fits best in your brain. The important thing to remember is that if we want to keep our values in order, use cosine first and then sine. That one, this will be the cosine and that will be the sine. All right, last step, and you can skip over writing it this way. The fastest way to write this is to put the hypotenuse first. The hypotenuse times the cosine of the degrees will give you the right value. And the hypotenuse times the sine of the degrees will give you the up value. If you push those through your calculator, and you know what? Oh no, I am using mine, darn it. Um, if you have any problems with the calculator work, please let me know. But once we get to this stage, we're gravy. A lot of this can happen in your head. I just am taking the time to spell it out so that you can really see where I'm getting these, uh, these calculations. The values that you will get should be minus 13.59 to the right, so that would be this value, and then minus 6.34 to the up. That's this value. Okay, uh, that's the right answer. I'm quite sure I checked the answers when I was working these through. So hopefully I still did that correctly. Um, and there you go. That is problem 15.9. That's taking a polar coordinate and moving it into rectangular coordinates. John often, he's been switching up the notation in this. So he might say 13.59 I with a carrot on it minus 6.34 J with a carrot on it. That's the very same thing. It's just a stylistic preference. So some people prefer to call these axes those names. They use the carrots because an I can mean an imaginary number. So they put a carrot on the I to mean, no, we don't mean that. We mean the rectangular coordinate system. And then since they don't use a dot but a carrot here, the same thing happens to the J. Um, it's just a stylistic preference. It doesn't matter. I much prefer to use right and up because they're logical, but John is preparing you for teachers in your future who may use different systems and he doesn't want them to throw you for a loop. Okay, now we are ready 
for 15.7. Take a breath. Lump. All right. This is homework 15.7. You guys, I'm gonna run and get my charging cord because my phone is starting to go and I don't wanna lose this whole lovely video to a dead battery. So, wait right there. returned I'm plugging in all right that's so much better Seven is the opposite of what we just did. It starts with the rectangular coordinates stated in those terms. My brain imme says immediately, let's recast those into right and ups. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is draw the picture. I'm going to draw all four quadrants. As I get better at this, I learn to look at this and guess which quadrant it is. I know it's negative right and positive up, so I know it's gonna be second quadrant. But in the beginning, you can just draw all four and go from there. Um, okay, so I take my grid and I just block off roughly where these numbers are gonna be. I'm gonna go here to the end. I'm gonna say that 7.08. It's on the negative right. And this is plus four two, so I'll make it a little bit less than that one. This is 4.2, okay? Now, I go to where those two places intersect and I put a dot there. That's the far corner of my triangle. I draw a line from that dot to the origin. And then I draw a dot, always to the origin is your first line. And then the second line, is to the horizon or the right. Remember how I talked about how uh, navigators orient themselves to the horizon here? We are like them. We always orient our triangles to this horizon line, never this one. So I draw down like so. All right. Now, my answer, I can tell from right here, it needs to be a polar coordinate. There's a bunch of them. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw a box right now to remind myself of what I'm trying to get to. This is my answer box. I know I need four of them, Lord have mercy. Right? And all of them are gonna go like this. They're all going to be a distance and a direction. We talked about that earlier. Whoops, ignore that. Okay, so this is gonna be the hypotenuse. I'm not gonna write it in all of them, but it's true for all of them. This is gonna be the hypotenuse of the triangle, and this is gonna be the angle as measured from the horizon, okay? So those are the two pieces of information that I need to get. Now notice that this 4.2 is also the measure of that side, right? This side is 7.08, this side is 4.2. So I can, um, I can use that as the lengths of my sides. So here's my angle. I don't know how big it is, but I know that this equals the opposite and this equals the adjacent, right? So my brain says, hey, what if we use um, the tangent to find that angle? Because the tangent of some angle, and we're gonna call it theta. I love to draw thetas. They're loopy little O's. 
the tangent of whatever that angle is, is equal to, let's see, tangent is opposite over adjacent, right, over Arthur. So it's going to be 4.2 divided by 7.08. Okay, simplify it first. We take the tangent of theta is equal to, and then we create, we divide that and get a decimal number. And I don't think I have that number in front of me. But um, you divide, you enter 4.2, divide by 7.08 equals, and then hit second and then tangent with the minus one key, right? That's the inverse of tangent. And I talked about that before in the lesson. This is when you have the decimal number, but you want the angle. The normal tangent button is when you have the angle and you want the decimal number. Okay, so what we find is that theta will equal 30.86, okay? Well, that's good to know. That's very helpful information. But now we need also to know the hypotenuse. Now, since we have the angle, we could use a trig function to get it, but another way that's super easy and fun is to use Pythagorean theorem. Because remember, this hypotenuse is the same as C in A squared plus B squared equals C squared, right? These would be the legs, the 4.2 and the 7.8. And so we can say that 4.2 squared plus 7.08 squared equals C squared or H squared, however you want to look at it. And then here's the way you can set, this is a little formula you can use. The hypotenuse will be equal to the square root of A squared plus B squared. There's our a squared, there's our b squared. So here's the way I did it. I enter 4.2, I square it, plus, then I put parentheses, I enter 7.08, I square it, I close the parentheses, and then I hit equal, and then I hit the square root sign. So play around until you can do that calculation well, and what you will get with these numbers is that the hypotenuse is equal to 8.23. Okay, so now we have the direction and we have the distance and we're ready to format it for our answers. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put the positive hypotenuse, 8.23. I'm gonna write the two positives on this side and then I'm gonna write the negatives on this side because I'm gonna use different pictures to help me figure those out. So this is how I always organize my boxes, my answer boxes so that I can keep straight what I'm doing. To me, the negative hypotenuse, that's the crazier scenario, all right? So I'm going to redraw, um, I'm gonna redraw the whole thing, all four quadrants, and I'm gonna put in what I know. Here's an angle, it's equal to 30.86, Pretend that's perfect. And my hypotenuse is 8.23, right? Okay, so for my first calculation, my angle, it needs to be the distance from here to here. So 30.86 is not what goes in the box. What goes in the box is this number, whatever this is, plus 90 degrees, okay? Or another way to look at that is I can take 180, this full span, and I can subtract 30.86. So, and that will give me this, which is what I need to write in here. So, 180 minus 30.86 is what goes in this box. There's no simple formula that tells you how to take the angle that you found and find the right angle here. You have to logic it out. What belongs in this answer box is this distance. So I need to figure out the easiest way to find that. I decide let's take 180, the whole thing, and subtract out the part that I know. The answer there is 149.32. So there's my first answer. All right. 
Now, still using my positive hypotenuse value, I know that I could also measure, I'm gonna use a different color to help you see it. I can also measure a negative angle, and that means I need to go around this way, and this way, and this way, to there, okay? There's a couple different ways that I could find that. I could go 90 plus 90 plus 30.86, that would work. And in fact, that's the way, is it 86 or 68? 86. Um, I may have transposed these numbers. I need to get my solutions manual. Which has gone missing? I can check in the back of the book. Hang on just a second. I just want to clarify this. I think I may have switched those digits and I don't want to confuse you. This is 15.7. I've got my textbook right here, but I don't have my solutions manual. But that's okay, the textbook should help me. It's 6.8. Okay, so I just copied this number wrong. And then this should be six, eight. I'm sorry. And this should be six, eight. I hope I didn't confuse you terribly. I just reversed those two digits. All the other explanation is fine. Okay, so what I can do to get this second answer that's gonna have the negative value is I can go 90 plus 90 is 180 plus 30.68 is going to be 210.68, okay? If I did this properly, the other way I could have done it is I could have said that this value is equal to the full circle minus this part, right? These two should always add up to 360, and I'm pretty sure those do zero, 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 six, three, yes. These two should add up to 360 if you've done it right. Cool, we did it. Now we're ready to tackle this negative hypotenuse drama. And what I'm gonna do, because I know my negative hypotenuse is gonna start with this, I'm going to, no, never mind. I was gonna try and be fancy in the way I drew my pictures, but I'm not. This time, we know that we still want the same line to be like this, but we're gonna send people here first, right? Anyone who's trying to figure out our problem, we're going to have them go to this point and then say, fooled you, go the other way. So this still needs to be 30.68 degrees. So now this is 30.68 degrees, right? Because these are vertical angles. So, and the distance is still 8.23, that's not changing, it's just negative. So for the first value, we wanna send them this far. It's kind of like laying out a scavenger hunt for other people. I don't know if you guys have ever done that. When my kids were little, I used to make those scavenger hunts all the time. I was a Girl Scout leader. We did a million scavenger hunts because it's so fun trying to follow someone else's clues. That's what these are like to me. So the first one, the negative one, we're going down here. For some reason, it's easier for me to see the negative one first because we're in the fourth quadrant. So I'm gonna write negative 30.68. And then again, to find the positive one, there's usually multiple ways we can see it. We can measure 90, 180, 270, plus that section, that would work. Or we can just say the whole circle minus 30.68, that should work, put in some decimals. The correct answer is 329. 
0.14. No, it should be 1. I still think I've got these decimals wrong. It's driving me a little crazy and it's making me It's 329.32 is what this should be. Okay? My whole drama, just so you know, my whole drama is the decimals up there. And in fact, it makes me want to do this whole problem over, but I'm not going to because I'm going to trust that you guys are smart enough not to get sidetracked with that. The important thing here to me is that you understand that in order to get these four different values, you have to draw the pictures and think logically about what you know and what you're trying to find out and then use the angle data that you have strategically with your basic, you know, 90 in a quadrant, 180 in a straight line. You have to logic out what you have. I personally have to draw the picture. I'm very visual and drawing the picture is what works for me. So, and then the other way is that if you set these boxes up so that you have positive, negative, here, positive hypotenuse, negative hypotenuse, Positive angle, negative angle, positive angle, negative angle. If you use that format, then I like it because these two add to 360 and those two add to 360. And that helps me double check my answers. These are correct after much drama with the decimals. I'm sorry, I apologize for that. I hate when it's not perfect. Um, let me know when we talk next week. We're going to talk about these problems again and see how they're feeling in your brains. Good luck. Thank you. I'll see you soon.